I wanted to talk to you about Killer Instinct. Yeah. And I don't mean actual killing people. You, you mean that sweet 90s video game? <laughs> yeah. Mortal Kombat ripoff? Uh, <laughs> I don't mean actually killing someone with a knife, but yeah. Killer Instinct, um, as it applies within you know the confines of MMA. Okay, yeah. And whether sparring, hard sparring, whether that contributes to, to Killer Instinct or not, a lot of people think it does. Like back when I started, that was the conventional wisdom. You should train like you want to fight. And so all we did was hard sparring and we beat each other up and we gave each other PTSD. Mm -hmm. And that was really counterproductive. There are a few people who benefit from hard sparring, like professional boxers, the high level professional boxers who can afford it. They will bring in basically live punching bags to spar with them and they will pay them per round or something like that. Like Mike Tyson used to pay people a thousand dollars back in like 1980, early 1980s money, which is, you know, it's a decent paycheck for each round, mm -hmm. except he would bring them in to beat them up so he could ingrain it in his muscle memory, beating people up, you know, throwing those punches without having to worry about taking significant damage. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't develop that PTSD. He would just develop the muscle memory of beating people up. And that is a really expensive, high risk way to train. Like if you have the money, I, I believe Floyd Mayweather has done this as well. A lot of, a lot of the high level boxers do this. I was speaking with, um, speaking online with the punch professor, shout out to the punch professor. He left this great comment. He tells all these great stories about about all these uh, you know, boxers back in the day and how they trained. And people would bring in boxers to spar with Muhammad Ali. They would give the sparring partners these big giant gloves and Muhammad Ali smaller gloves oh, and just pay them to basically be punching bags. And yeah, man, it was a really common thing. So I can see how that can develop the killer instinct because you don't get the PTSD, you don't have the fear, you don't develop the fear that way. You bring in these guys you know you can beat up. And that's kind of terrible. Like, <laughs> it's terrible if you think about the, the moral ramifications of this. But the way combat sports are going right now, at least MMA, which I, you know, Robbie Lawler, um, you know, I can't speak highly enough of him for pioneering this, this line of thought, the idea of light technical sparring you don't need to get into fights at the gym mm -hmm. like he's had one of the longest running careers in the ufc for a very good reason because he doesn't get into fights in the gym he focuses on light technical sparring in fact the way he put it he says i don't even spar anymore i mean he, he does it's like you know what we do at the gym it's light and technical nobody's getting hurt nobody's getting traumatized nobody's getting beaten up or cut mm -hmm. you know he's got the big gloves and, and all that but a lot of people are having a hard time getting on this bandwagon because they think exactly what you asked. They, they, they're wondering, if I don't do the regular hard sparring, am I going to lose my killer instinct? Am I going to lose my edge? And I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case at all. One thing that really helped me... Um, to develop the ability to pull the trigger, because that's something I lacked when I started out. And I would attribute it largely to the hard sparring. That's why I had trouble pulling the trigger. Because I felt like if I make a false move, I'm going to pay for it dearly. Oh, yeah. Basically, if, if I move wrong, I'm going to pay for it. And that caused me to freeze a lot. That caused me to second guess everything. And I was like, I can't afford to make any mistakes. And so I made every mistake because of that. Mm -hmm. So I had this boxing coach, um, and, and he pulls me aside. He, he sees me training a little bit, and he's like, we're, we're going to do this differently. He gets a sparring partner um, close to my skill level and experience, and he's like, all right, you guys are going to shadow spar. I'm like, we're going to what now? Throw punches at each other, but don't connect. I'm like, um, well, that sounds like a wimpy little drill, but I'll yeah. do it, okay? <laughs> so I get in there, and I feel like, I feel like, man, what is this, like, point karate you know not even that like not even light contact no contact yeah. and i'm feeling like this is the wimpiest thing ever but we spend about a month just sparring like that no contact at all mm -hmm. and so 
the genius of this was he was reprogramming me because he saw like I was suffering from PTSD from the ring from these hard sparring matches he saw like I'm flinching in all the wrong ways right and so he's reprogramming me getting me used to stepping in the ring and not being afraid not being afraid to make a mistake not being afraid to get hit. And then gradually he introduced me to progressive sparring. All right, now you're just going to throw really light jabs. Just barely touch each other with that jab. Like half speed even. And so we're just pawing at each other with the jab. And then we figure out all these different ways to use the jab. Then we start getting really right. technical with the jab. And we do this for like a month. Just the jab. And, you know, gradually we introduce the other punches. But we keep it at this really sustainable level so we can spar for like an hour a day easy without getting damaged or anything like that and I was like wow this is fun and I start looking forward to sparring I'm start starting to look forward to getting in the ring and so when fight time came I was looking forward to stepping in the ring I was like this is going to be this is going to be okay this is going to be all right there wasn't that fear there wasn't that sense of dread like my stomach tying up into knots like it was before mm -hmm. and I get in the ring I fight three rounds I feel pretty good about it and you know it was it was one of my better fights at that point in my life. It was a kickboxing match. But I had a boxing coach train me for it, which was so interesting because so many boxing coaches are the polar opposite of that. Right. In fact, I would say most of the boxing coaches I, I've, I've worked with and known over the years, they just put you in the ring to fight in the gym mm -hmm. and call it sparring and call it good. And then, you know, the most the craziest psychos rise to the top and yeah right and everybody else just dies along the way and yeah man if a lot of people train at that type of gym and those gyms you know they they do produce good fighters but i don't think they produce the volume of good fighters that they could they produce one or two they don't produce 20 or 30 or 50 mm. or everybody with those that viable skill set Okay, but it this kind of sounds like you're talking more about not being afraid yeah. to throw punches and not being afraid of getting hit back. Yeah. Uh, and I think, like, Robbie Lawler, of course, is a great example of this because in the ring he is very reckless and he has very, an, a very yeah. exciting fight style. If you, you know, you never would guess that he's not in the gym practicing being crazy like that. But what about that... Being comfortable smacking somebody in the face with all your might. Because hmm. that's what I'm wondering about. And I think of some very violent examples, of course, that are, you know, over the top. Like when yeah. Rampage Jackson knocked out Vanderlei Silva. And then, you know, Vanderlei is just lying there unconscious and Rampage is still punching him. Of course, he hates the guy. It's driven by a lot of personal feelings. But yeah. still, just to, like, punch someone's face like that. And then I compare that to myself, how I feel. And like, I don't think I've ever had yeah. that in me where I could just ugh, unload it's, on it's someone's a weird nose feeling. like that. I remember the first time, first time I connected an elbow on somebody's face. So it was, it was a fight back in the US and I had my opponent pinned up against the cage. And I hear my, my corner man, he's pummeling for an underhook. And my corner man says, elbow now. Because that's an excellent counter for somebody pummeling for the underhook. Right. And for a split second, there was a bit of a moral dilemma, like, oh, but that's oh, me. Really? And I was like, but he's going to get that underhook, and then he'll do something bad to me. So, boom, I hit him right in the face with that elbow. And, and then the look he gave me, it was, it was like, it was the weirdest look. It was a look like I had just hurt his feelings on a very deep level. Like, not, not hatred, but it was somewhere between, like, Almost like, how could you betray me? <laughs> like, you betrayed my trust by doing that. The face is a sacred place, and you've just violated my, my sacred place, wow. basically. Like, that type of look. Did it impact you at all to get that, to get that look? It, it did, but then I dropped another elbow on him, and then another. And, uh, you know, I remember, you, you don't really have time to process these feelings in the cage, in a sure, cage fight. of course, yeah. But I remember that look, and afterwards, it kind of stuck with me. I was like... I did something really mean yeah. to a human being, to one of my fellow men. I just like bashed his face in with the hardest, pointiest parts of my elbows repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And it's so crazy because outside of the ring, I know you, and I know you would never do that yeah. to someone. 
So that's what I'm wondering about, about turning that switch when you get into the cage or ring or whatever and just ha turning on that ability to elbow someone in the face. It, it's a strange thing. I think, I think you need to get beaten up a few times. Like you need to have the PTSD experience, then you need to get over it, mm. basically. Because what that PTSD, that PTSD experience, you know, get, getting beaten up, getting roughed up a bit teaches you is this is what happens if you don't fight back. Right. So it's difficult for most people because most people, we grow up in a civilization. We are civilized. We are rewarded for doing the right thing. We are rewarded for not dropping elbows on our neighbor's faces. We are rewarded for being nice guys. And in a cage fight, it's the opposite. You are rewarded for being violent. Mm. You are rewarded for acting like a psychopath, basically. Yeah. Well, things that you would never even legally be allowed to do outside. Exactly. Exactly. If you choke somebody, say, in the state of Utah, for example, that's, that's a felony. You, you go to prison for that. That's attempted murder. Yeah, strangulation. Some states are like that. Some have different self-defense laws. Um, if you punch somebody in the face, that's, that's assault and battery, you know? Yeah. Anything like that, just laying a hand on somebody. If, if, you, put, if you grab somebody's wrist, like, hey, wait up, I'm not done talking to you yet. That's assault <laughs> in the United States, in almost yeah. every state, even, even if you do not physically harm that person. But again, in a cage fight, the rule is not survive. The rule is be the danger. Mm -hmm. Be the danger in the cage. Not get away from the danger. Be the danger. Which is such a alarming thing for civilized people to do. Because again, that's the realm of psychopaths, basically. That's what psychopaths are comfortable with. Right. Because they have no, no feelings, no, no empathy for right. others. So we put the empathy aside for a bit... And you can rationalize it a lot of different ways, like you tell yourself, all right, this is different now. This is a cage fight. We have agreed to this. This is a consensual agreement. He wants this. This guy wants me to drop this elbow in his face, even though he gave me that dirty look. Yeah. Right? Y you have to create narratives. Like this, this is what worked for me anyway. I, I had this coach... Um, a guy I fought, actually, he knocked me out my first Muay Thai fight ever, Jeff Moody. And afterwards, he, he said, I want to coach you. I want to see you win a fight. And so, you know, he coached me. Not against psychologically. me. Psychologically. someone else. Yes, against, I want to see you win a fight against someone else. Yes, <laughs> exactly. But he coached me psychologically more than technically. Because what I was lacking wasn't technique. You know, I knew all the kicks and punches and whatnot. It was the ability to pull the trigger. Mm. And what he coached me to do was basically tell my, create a narrative, a narrative where it is not just okay, not just acceptable, but imperative that you hurt that other person, wow. that you go to this dark place in your mind. And the first time I did it, you know, my opponent goes in the cage first and he's, he's kind of hopping up and down. And Jeff, he looks at me and he says, you see that he's dancing. He's dancing. He thinks this is a game. He is disrespecting you. And he's just, you oh know, hopping up and down like goodness. any fighter would, you know, going in there, getting warm, staying warm. And, and I'm like, well, well, no, he's not. He's like, yes, he is. He is disrespecting you. See that little dance he's doing up there? He thinks he owns that cage. He thinks he's just going to do whatever he wants. He thinks he's going to humiliate you. You're going to put up with that? And I'm like, no, sir. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? So it really was tapping into anger, tapping into these negative emotions. That, that first time. To drive it. So that first time, I put myself into a really dark place. And I went in there and I beat this guy up a little bit. And it was the first time, yeah, my first cage fight were, were it was actually my first cage fight ever. Because uh, before that, I was a kickboxer, made the transition to MMA. This guy had challenged me to an MMA fight on the internet. He basically said, you yeah, you're, you're just a kickboxer. You wouldn't stand a minute with me in a, in a cage fight. You don't know how to grapple. And I was like, let's find out. And <laughs> well, there's the negative emotions right there. Yeah, but I, this, I didn't take it that way. called you out on the internet. I know, right? Uh, that's, what, that's the dark place I probably should have gone to logically, but I didn't because I was just way too nice for my own good, basically. So I'm a super nice guy. Just putting that out there. <laughs> Not bragging. I'm a nice guy. Yeah. Right? But the cage fight is the wrong place to be a nice guy. 
And so Jeff, he's working me up in the corner and, and like every little thing, everything he could draw on to create this dark narrative in my mind, he did. And he was like, you understand what you have to do? I was like, yes, I do. So I go in there and I got violent Wow! for the first time in my life. It wasn't a technically great fight, but it was a violent fight. Which and is I, what you had been lacking before. Yeah. So this really changed it for you, this, this mindset. Yeah, and if you look it up on Sure Dog, it says I won the fight with a guillotine choke. I did not. I had him in a front headlock. I didn't even know what a guillotine choke was at the time. Again, I was a kickboxer transitioning to MMA. It was my first MMA fight ever, zero grappling experience. I had him in a front headlock, looks like a guillotine choke. I was punching him in the liver repeatedly as many times as I could with my left hand. He drops to his knees. If you've taken a liver shot, you know what that, that's like. He drops to his knees. I sprawl on him and keep hitting him in the liver. He starts tapping Ooh. out. The referee does not see the tap out. I keep going. Boom, boom. Because you don't stop when the guy taps out. You stop when the referee tells you to stop. Right. And I just keep going, like, you know, just like this, this wild, menacing darkness inside of me just coming out for the first time in my life. And it ends. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I can go back to normal now. Weird. And there was this moment, like after my first, probably my first 10 professional fights, where there were like two days of just processing it afterward. Wow. Just processing everything. Like, man, that was strange. That was the strangest thing ever. Like my first kickboxing match, I got my ear ripped off, my left ear ripped off, and then surgically reattached. Yes. I know when, when, you're, when mm. your body is like disfigured, like you, you had your arm broken in a really gnarly way in a jiu-jitsu match. And, man, w what did that do psychologically to you? <laughs> like, how long did it, did it take you to process that? Like, your bone was poking out and everything. Well, it wasn't, no. It wasn't. Poking under the skin, basically. Yeah, it was messed up. Um, oh, man. I didn't really even understand it. Like, in the moment, I didn't feel it. But yeah. I, lo I remember looking down, and my elbow was on top of my, it, my elbow basically came down and touched my hand. Yeah, I was like, "Ooh, that should not be there," you know. And it, like, at in the moment, I couldn't, I couldn't even react to it. Um, of course, I had to tap out. Um, yeah. But yeah, later on, for sure, like, and, and you feel it when you're uh, getting ready, when you're getting into it and moving it, and of course, you're you're conscious of it. You know, if you, my elbow still feels different, so it does come into my mind. But if I'm in a situation that like if I'm sparring with someone, I'm not thinking about it at all. Yeah. Because I've got all these other things on my mind. It's totally taking up my mind. Yeah, but just like the, let's say like two days after after you broke your arm. Oh, like yeah. What, <laughs> what, what were you thinking, man? What was going on in your, in your mind? Why did I do that jiu-jitsu tournament? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. It's the regret. It's strange. Like, why did I stand back up with him? Oh man, that was a big thing. Yeah, because we were. I knew he was. He was good at judo, and we were already on the ground. And then I forced a stand up. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, it's weird when the, when there's damage to your body. Your body remembers it. It's yeah. got this memory. This memory separate from your cognitive memory in your mind. I mean, it remembers every punch, every kick, every every bit of damage, mm. every elbow to the face, every. Yeah, a moment where you're getting squished and crushed, it remembers the violence. Yeah. And processing that violence is, it was weird. It's, it's one of the reasons I tell people your first 10 fights are going to suck. You might win your first 10 fights. You might lose them. You might win some and lose some, but they're going to suck because you're, gonna, you're learning how to process that. Mm. You're learning how to flip the switches. You're learning all the incidentals the gym cannot teach you. You know, besides, you know, performance anxiety, performing in front of a crowd, you're learning to put some violence in your violence. It's one of the, one of these statements I find myself saying to, uh, to fighters a lot when, when they have trouble executing a technique, not for any technical reason, but because they're lacking the violent intent. Right. And you have to remember all martial arts techniques that we use, I mean, all martial arts techniques must have violent intent they are to injure they are to hurt they are to do damage they are to kill essentially but not everybody has that is tapping into those negative emotions yeah and like there are some fighters who and like i said i only did that once 
Oh, okay. I needed to the first time, but afterward, I realized I could create different narratives okay. in my mind. And I, I created narratives for, for a while, for a few years after that. Well, what and were those narratives like? Because like, I think about really nice, you know, notoriously nice fighters yeah. who are competitive. Oh, yeah. And that's what I don't understand because to me, this is not a level, this is not about competition. It's not about, oh, I'm going to outwork this person. When you're, yeah. you know, when you're Stephen Thompson and you're so nice, but you're very competitive exactly. and you want to win. How do you get mad at a guy it's, like that? Like, how could you be mad at George St. Pierre? He's the nicest guy ever, right? Yeah. And, and that's another guy who was never like negative towards his opponents, was not going to some dark place in order to yeah. beat the crap out of them. The worst so, thing George St. Pierre ever said was, I am not impressed with your performance. That was his one attempt at smack talking. Yeah. And yeah. it became the laughing stock of the internet. He was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm done. I'm done being the heel. Yeah. I'm the nice guy. It just doesn't work for me. And he was right to do that. But that's what I mean. These guys who are so nice, not going into a dark place, but they're competitive. To me, yeah. that does not make any sense. because it's That one is even more powerful than being the heel. But it's one thing to to try to outwork somebody, yeah. but to try to out beat up somebody is yeah. just a whole other level to me. Exactly. That I don't get. Exactly, man. So, it's what kind of narratives were you making after you moved away from this negative hmm. kind of stuff? You know, putting it in concrete words, like that first one, like he's dancing, so be mad at him because he's disrespecting you. Mm -hmm. Uh, that that that's easy, but it's it's also easy to not believe. Yeah, that's that's like acting. Well, he's just it's like you're playing a up. character. Like I, I have a friend, Johnny Ritchie. He had the uh, the nickname, the little ball of hate. Ooh. And before every fight, he would tell him he would create this narrative that this person he's about to fight just killed his whole family and tortured them and did horrible things, and he he's out for revenge, and and. And he was like a method actor. Yeah. So he would tell himself this story and he would become this character and you would just see his face and it was just hate, just absolute hate. Like, I hate you. I am going to kill you for what you've done, that type of thing. Like, against total strangers, against nice guys, you would see that in his face. That's how he got his nickname. And if if you are a method actor or have the, the psychology of a method actor, that can work. It, wor it worked for Johnny. But I realized pretty early on that's that's not going to work for me because I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> I'm a terrible actor, man. I really am. So the narratives became more more abstract. It was more like, in a way, like dehumanizing the person. Like not not that he's not a person, but he's a he's a target. Okay. Basically, he's a target. Not 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 a nice guy. Like I had this fight against this guy uh, Ricardo Hernandez, who was the nicest guy. And before the fight, Ricardo, you know, he introduced himself, shakes my hand, talks to me. And, and I realized, man, if we weren't fighting, this guy could be my best friend. He's so nice, man. We could, <laughs> we could hang out or something. And he, he's just being so incredibly nice and respectful the whole time. Like up until the moment we touch gloves and, and then he comes out and tries to Superman punch my head off right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. At which point I was like, okay, okay. Yeah. No longer time to be a nice guy, but that got in my head. Yeah. That got in my head in a big way. That's why I said it's much more powerful to be the nice guy, to be the face, than to be the heel. The heel sells tickets. The nice guy gets in your head. Like, you think Conor McGregor, you know, gets in people's heads, you know, with his, his trash talk. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But the nice guy gets in your head in a much deeper way. Because it prevents you from flipping that switch like you should be doing. Mm. So, yeah. Word to the folks at home, all those kids idolizing the heels, idolizing the bad guys. Yeah, you need those guys to sell tickets. But, as far as sports psychology goes, it is hard to drop elbows in the nice guy's face. And that was Ricardo. You know, I had him up against the, up against the fence. That's when I dropped the elbows on him when my coach told me to. That's when he gave me that look like you betrayed me. Oh, I thought we were I thought guy. we were bros, bro. Yeah. Like he gave me that look. And that was a powerful look. Like that had a that that almost stopped me. It almost stopped me. Except I realized, you know, it's a fight. He's agreed to do this. I've agreed to do this. It's a sport of fighting. We both enjoy the sport of fighting. If we didn't enjoy it, if we you know, why would be why would be be in here right nobody's being forced to be in here 
So not everybody can do that. Not everybody should do that. You know, there are plenty of people who, you know, should train. Everybody should train. And plenty of people who are great technicians in the gym should stay in the gym. Mm. Some of them should definitely give cage fighting a try. You know, we had the, this conversation a while back about, you know, different types of boxing coaches. And I told you about this, uh, this boxing coach. When people would come to his gym, the first thing he would do is punch them in the mouth and then say, do you still want to box? And if they did, he would, he would train them and most of them would just walk right out again. And you said something along the lines of what a crappy trainer, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying that coaches should be that way, but everybody needs to have that punched in the face type of experience. You know, whether that is their first fight or or a rough sparring match or something like that, they, they need to get punched in the face so they can answer the question, do I really want to do this? Mm. Do I really want to get in the cage and, and pull the trigger? Do I really want to be that person, even if it's just for 15 minutes? Can I come back from being that person? That's, that's another thing. Like everybody says, can we flip the switch and we assume that we can just switch it off and on again, right? Hmm. But I'm going to tell you something. Once you flip that switch, part of it is always on. Oh. I'm not saying you're going to go around just dropping elbows on random people. But, um, but does it make it easier to do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The more you do it, the easier it is to do. Mm -hmm. The more you hurt people, the easier it is to hurt people. The more you desensitize yourself to something. This probably sounds like cage fighting is evil, and it, it kind of is. <laughs> it, <laughs> Wait a minute. It's not, you're not out there holding hands. It's not checkers. It's a dirty, rotten cage fight. And... I think people are mystified by the fact that there are nice guys, there are quality human beings, there are great people who do mixed martial arts, there are some, some, you know, shining examples of citizens of the world who are champion cage fighters. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for, for us to process that. How can this person be a great cage fighter and do this dirty, rotten, evil thing in the cage and just hurt somebody? and still be a nice guy when they step out. Mm -hmm. I think in many ways it's harder for the fans to come to terms with than it is for the fighters. As you know, after those first 10 fights that suck, that's about as much conditioning as it takes for the average person to, you know, pull the trigger, if you will, I would say, as long as they can avoid the PTSD. Right, and so they'll be able to say, okay, this is fight time, and this is my, my personality, my identity during the fight. And then when yeah. it's over, switch back to normal person mode yeah. and not have to go through that time of processing afterwards? Yeah, I guess. It's, it's kind of like going to Disneyland. Oh. Here's what I mean by that. Call back. Okay. In real life, we don't get to go on all these fun rides every day, right? You don't get to go take a picture with Mickey Mouse every day, right? But on that special occasion where you buy the ticket to Disneyland... You can go on all the rides if you're willing to wait in those ridiculously long lines. Okay? Or, let, let's use Dinosaur Land as another example because the lines are much shorter. So you buy your ticket to Dinosaur Land. You go there. You can watch all the crazy shows. You can go on all the crazy rides. You can go on the crazy roller coaster. They have one of the craziest ones at Dinosaur Land, by the way. It, like, spins around in four separate directions. Oh, it takes man. you on loop-de-loops. It's nuts. It's cool, though. But on that special occasion, you go to the theme park, you can do what you want that day. And then you leave Dinosaur Land or Disneyland and you're back to normal life again. No dinosaurs. No dinosaurs, no Mickey Mouse, no rides, just boring work or whatever it is you do. You have to play by the rules from that point on. Okay. That's kind of what a cage fight is to a cage fighter who loves cage fighting. It's Disneyland. You get in that cage and it's that moment, that one brief moment where you got to break all the rules. You got to go on this fun ride that you don't get to go on before. Mm. It's it's the reward for all that hard training. A lot of people think you know the the fight is what you dread, and that's PTSD speaking. That's post traumatic stress syndrome from all the hard sparring speaking. But again, to somebody who loves the sport, the cage fight is the event. It's it's the Disneyland, and once you get out of there, you know if you are a mentally well 
stable human being, you, you recognize, all right, I have to wait until my next turn in the cage to do that again. Mm-hmm. So, did that answer the question? I guess. Yeah, there, there are no simple oh. answers to that. There really aren't. I think I don't. Yeah, I don't think there is one answer for it, um, and I think a lot of it is something that is very difficult to understand from the outside. But w- like you're talking about, if you go in and have ten fights, oh my word! Like, of course that would change anyone's mind or make up anyone's uh. mind. Ten fights, you would get you would get enough of a picture where you could understand. And yeah. if you make it through ten fights you figured out how to punch people in the face, that's for sure. It's one of those reasons that wrestlers do so well in MMA. Not so much the technique, although that certainly helps. Not so much the athleticism, although that certainly helps. That's a big part of it. But one of the big things is the wealth of amateur experience. Mm -hmm. It's a different sport. It's a similar related sport, but it's a different one. But when you have amateur experience stepping on the mat, like, you know, a high school wrestler by the time they finish high school they have at least 50 matches under their belts yeah at least and you know if if they've done more tournaments competed more won more significantly more than 50 right 50 matches they got over that first 10 sucking a long time ago they right. got over the incidentals they got over the moral hang-ups of twisting a guy into a pretzel and making him hurt yeah or a karate kids probably a similar thing yeah. Like these young karate guys who grow up having tournaments from, you know, the age of four or whatever. They're so used to the competition, the rises and falls, yeah. and the hitting and being hit. Yeah, I'm, I'm very outspoken about the idea that you don't need childhood experience to be a good fighter. But what really comes in handy from that childhood experience, just like you said, is the competition. Because when you get those 10 fights out of the way when you're a kid... Man, everything else is Disneyland after that, if you yeah. will, as far as fights goes. Mm. Yeah, because I'm totally the opposite. I, Like I said, I played all these other sports growing up, and it wasn't until I was in my early 20s when I started doing jiu-jitsu at first. And then the idea of going in a jiu-jitsu tournament was just ludicrous. Like, uh, oh, man, I have, I've only been doing this for, you know, for how long? Uh, I bet these people have been doing it forever. Uh, yeah, I really wish I had started at a much younger age to, you know. It's yeah. The, it's the same reason I wish I kissed a girl at a younger age, you know. Mm. When it finally did happen, I was so scared. Oh, I wish I just got that out of the way a lot earlier. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, that you know, they say you know, they say fighting is like Disneyland or kissing a girl. <laughs> they say both both are okay. They say both those things. First time is going to be awkward, right? <laughs> Man, first time I kissed a girl. I was in sixth grade. I was not expecting it to happen. She kissed me. Oh, boy. She kissed me. There this was this girl named forward, Jennifer. She used to come over to my graders. house after school. I don't remember why. I guess her mom and my mom were friends. And I got this idea I was going to ask her to be my girlfriend. Oh, man. Because she was a pretty girl. So I was like, Jennifer, do you want to... Do you want to go with me? Because you didn't say, do you want to be my girlfriend back then? You Like in my school, we would say, do you want to go with me? Wow. And she just she just smooched me right there. I was like, I guess that's a yes. Whoa, whoa. What just happened? Oh. Am I pregnant? I don't even know what happened. See, but you got it out of the way. Got that's, it out of the way, yeah. Yeah. And now so, I bet you can kiss a girl no problem. Well, exactly, because I'm <laughs> married now. <laughs> It didn't happen again for many years. And that's, I guess that kissing is like fighting in this sense. Because if you go for many years without any like full context experience, you, you might be second guessing yourself. Mm. You might be thinking, do I still have it? Can I still pull the trigger? All I've done for the last 15 years is light contact sparring. I mean, I'm really technical when the guy's not trying to kill me. But what happens when they do, right? So that's probably more along the lines of the question you were asking. So to answer that, I would say I think the Thais have it really well, the w- their system, the way they do it. So in the gym in Thailand, most Thai fighters are really light, really technical. They say, let's play in the ring instead of let's spar in the ring. And they're not hurting each other, especially with the elbows. Some of these guys, they have so much control, they can just get really close, but like no impact with the elbow and all that. And it's, it's, it's just beautiful the way they're able to spar. But once every two weeks, 
or once every week, depending on, on where they, li- they live, they get in the ring and they fight for real and they go out and they have a full contact fight. Mm-hmm. And so they, they constantly have this validation, like every week or every two weeks, they have this validation. I know how to fight. So my light sparring in the gym is a representation, a, an honest representation of my fighting skill. So I've heard some people argue, do full contact sparring once in a while. And I tried that for a while. I tried, okay, I'm going to do full contact sparring once every two weeks to emulate like the, the Thai style of, you know, train light and technical for two weeks, then have a, have a full contact fight. And the problem with that is that you end up hurting training partners. Yeah. And unless you are bringing in professional fighters like, you know, Mike Tyson and Ali did to get beat up, that doesn't work very well. Mm-hmm. You end up injuring your training partners and injuring yourself, and then you lose training time. So, and at the same time, you, you don't learn to flip the switches in the right ways or the right switches because you, you end up fighting the wrong people. When you spar at the gym, when you spar enough with the same guys, you start to recognize each other's patterns. Yeah. You start to learn how to beat that one guy. Like, you know, you learn Andrew's skills, you learn Ramsey's skills, you learn how to counter that one dude, and that other dude still gives you trouble until you figure him out, right? In a lot of ways, it's, it's much more difficult to spar my own students, even if they're not as good as some professional fighters. Like, when I spar with you, like, you figured out a lot of my game. Like, a lot of my stand-up game, you have it figured out. Yeah, and so you're one of my favorite sparring partners because you've recognized a lot of my patterns, and you, 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 know, you, can, you can challenge me in, in these unique ways, and it forces me to develop my game further. But when I go to another gym and I spar with these guys who don't know anything about my game, and you know I can dance circles around them with my tricks, and, <laughs> and just pull all, all these different tricks out that they don't know, they haven't seen yet, yeah. and surprise them, right? But then I come back to the gym and I, I train with, you know, guys who aren't at that level yet, but they are, they know me. And so it's it's a different thing. It's a different uh, system. Mm-hmm. At the same time, guys in your own gym have a vested interest in your success. So when we spar, I've got a vested interest in helping you succeed. I've got a vested interest in in seeing that you get better. And I imagine, I would like to think you have a vested interest in, in helping me get better as well. We're not trying to knock each other down a peg. We're trying to build each other up, right? Mm-hmm. We're on the same team. When I go to a different gym, you know, even if we're being nice, even if we're being civilized, even if we're sparring light and friendly, there's still this different element. We're, we are helping each other out because we're throwing all these unknown variables at each other. But at the same time, we don't have that vested interest in building you up c- because we're part of a different team. So it's, it's a very different dynamic. But when you fight, it's neither of those things. You're not building each other up in any way. You're mm-hmm. strictly trying to tear that guy down. So if we were to step in the ring at the gym and try to tear each other down, oh man, that damages the student-coach relationship in many ways. Um, so I suppose my proposed solution to this is if you want to be a fighter, make sure you are having fights on a regular basis to ensure that you are able to practice your craft. And you are able to flip the switch and get, you know, those 10 crappy fights out of the way until you master that skill. Mm -hmm. But if you're a gym rat and there's nothing wrong with that and you, you just love being in the gym and sparring and training and that's good and you should and everybody should do that. And you're worried, what if I'm attacked out on the streets? What if Master Wong jumps out and tries to rip off my, my genitals and something like that? Who knows? Right? What am I going to do? Will it be enough? Will I be able to pull the switch in that situation? <laughs> uh, you can't just shrug. Come on. <laughs> it was a long monologue, right? <laughs> Ending with a question. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. That's the honest answer. I don't know. 
but let's find out. Yeah. One problem I have, I like I said, I don't think I have that in me. Uh, you know, I'm I'm the gym rat category that you talked about. I'm the yeah. latter group, where I'm not interested in becoming a professional fighter. I like working out and I like training. I like trying to know more and more about MMA and get better at MMA, but not yeah. trying to become a professional. But yeah, if that happens, if Mr. if Master Wong did attack me on the street. <laughs> I don't I know that example. I, I don't know if it's ingrained in me, just like in myself, my own personality, whether I've trained or not. I don't know if I have that in me because yeah. I've never done that. I've never like yeah. tried to hurt somebody like that. Even the situations I've been in, in the I've been in very mild street situations. Yeah. You don't know yourself yet. You don't know yeah. your primal self. I yet. haven't needed to get somebody. There was a fighter I cornered, and I don't know his name. I never knew his name. He showed up to a fight without a corner. I was there uh, coaching some of my fighters I trained in my gym back in the U.S. And there's this little skinny dude, and he looks like he's 14 years old. He was at least 21 because it was a, it was at a, a club. He had to be 21 to get in, but he looked like a kid. Mm -hmm. And his opponent just looked like a savage. And I thought, man... This kid's going to get killed. And he comes up to me and he says, hey, can you corner me? I don't have a corner. He's got a little squeaky voice. He looks like, I don't know. I just cannot overemphasize how wimpy this guy looked. Yeah. And I thought, he's, he's going to die in there, man. And he's he gonna didn't die. even have a corner. It just seems like he had no gym, no experience, yeah. nothing. And it was his first fight. He hadn't really trained. Oh. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man, I'll, I'll do what I can to help you, you know. Well, let's, let's go see what happens. So we go in there, and this little scrawny 14-year-old looking guy, he gets punched in the face like five or six times. He just kind of stands there like a deer in headlights, looking scared, gets punched in the face five or six times, and then his facial expression changes, and he screams, <laughs> and he leaps through the air, does a flying guillotine choke, grabs that guy, chokes his opponent unconscious as he's screaming, ah! just screaming at the top of his lungs. The referee has to pry this this guy off of him. And it's a big referee, big, strong referee, just, you know, trying to pull this guy off, like, let go, it's done, you won. And has to just tackle this dude to get him off because he's just possessed with superhuman strength at this moment. And the guy comes back to the corner. I'm like, hey, congratulations, you won your first fight. And the guy's like, Whoa, what, what happened? What happened? I said, you, you just won a cage fight. He's like, well, I don't remember. I don't remember anything. I blacked out. Like, he, he blacked out. He had no memory. He said, all I remember is the, the guy was punching me, and then, and then the referee was holding up my hand. That's a dangerous dude right there. Yeah. This, this scrawny, wimpy-looking, 14-year-old-looking adult is a dangerous dude. Like, like, that's a guy... That's scary. ...who didn't need the 10 fights... To flip the switch and pull the trigger. Yeah. And when he did, man, he just went on autopilot. That yeah. Talk, we were talking about going to a dark place. He went to a whole nother he level. He literally went to a dark place because everything blacked out. Wow. Man, he, he just went went to the blackness, man. The blackest, blackest dark place he could. <laughs> wow. That is scary, though, because that's like, oh, um, like it, it makes me think he could do something a lot worse than that and yeah be like, ah, imagine if a guy is in that situation you piss him off and he has a knife in his hand yeah or a knife in his pocket and then he blacks like, out and i wakes don't know up, what happened bunch of bodies all over the place i right. don't know how this happened i've heard a lot of stories like that really you know, from criminal defendants like you know i it was oh, a crime yeah. of passion right i don't remember what happened you know it wasn't me it was my other self for you know disassociative personality disorder something like that hmm and somehow that's a justifiable defense. I, I don't know how. Well, if he had a long history of doing it in the cage, <laughs> maybe. I wonder, right? I wonder.